and uh, let us open in prayer. Lord, we're here because we want to worship you. We're your children. We're here as friends. We support each other. Father, we want to be your friend. We want to do what you want us to do. We want to seek you. We want to love you more. Father, help us to experience this time. Help us to experience your presence in each of our lives right now. Open our hearts, open our minds, and just may this be a blessed time. Father, just touch us. We seek you. We seek your presence, Lord. And I just pray that you would just be with us and just draw us closer and we lift up the worship band that your spirit may just work through them and enlighten our hearts. And we just thank you for this day and this time, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> Go ahead, Eric. Everyone stand up. Let's do our call to worship together. Good morning, Red Oak. Good morning. Call of worship this morning is taken from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with all with my whole heart I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called you, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my life. Thou my wisdom, Thou my true word, I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my grandfather, and I Thy true son. Thou in me dwelling, and I Heart of my own heart, whatever be 
sing this doxology with me. Let's let this whole place ring out with praises to our God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Junior worship. They are on their way out to learn and study the good word. There's a good group of them today. Happiness, are you ready for this? Blessings on you. That's a good group right there. You know, we ought not to um, ever miss things that we think might be little things in a service that maybe are bigger things than we realize. I think sometimes we're trained, you know, almost desensitized to the little things that can matter. We just had a string of youth and children go out to learn about Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we can make that like just a little, little side blurb in the middle of a service, but you know what? They're worshiping too. They're hearing the word too. And I feel like right now in this prayer, maybe we could just take a moment and pray for those young minds to absorb the gospel of Jesus Christ even at a young and tender age, amen? So why don't we just take a moment and I'm going to ask Pastor Don if you'd also pray for the, for the word today. But Lord, we think about a culture that I think in many ways has grown farther and farther away from you. And Lord, even in recent times, it almost seems like there's an antagonism towards Christ towards our faith. And I think about us and how important it is to be rooted in the gospel and to remember the calling that is in our lives in Christ Jesus. To remember that the Lord said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. To remember that no matter what Anybody around us feels we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I also think about the generation coming up and about how those roots will begin to grow in them. Not only withstand the storms, but when roots are just learning to develop, how will, how will it hold up? Only through your spirit, almighty God. Only through your spirit will the seed of the gospel survive the storm. And Lord Jesus, you said that not even the gates of hell will withstand against the church. So I know that there are seeds being planted. I know there is a generation rising up. I know there are lives still to be changed. We know the gospel will go forward because you're in it. Because you're here. Make us right today. Lord our God, it says in your word that your word is a lamp unto our feet. Oh, Lord, we need that lamp. Oh, Lord, brighten our day with your light, the light of your word. May your word, which is a lamp unto our feet, also permeate society. 
Lord, we look forward to a revival. We look forward for, for perhaps a separation between those who are genuinely committed to Jesus and those who are not. So, Lord, we need your word. We count on your word right now. Grant unto Pastor Ryan your spirit that he might be speaking the light that you have ordained for us to have this morning as we attend. May it be, O oh God, no coincidence that we are here today all together, but that you are in the midst of us. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, the one who has taught us to pray in this manner, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It feels good to be back from vacation. I'm not going to lie. It felt good to be on vacation. Yeah, but it's good to be back. Thank you, Cher. I, I want to thank um, Pastor Tony for filling in for me and um, Pastor Don for filling in for me. And I know, Jim, you just did the men's group. And I, I love that a team is being built that, I, I, that is going to help raise all of us up to maturity in Christ. And one of the things that I know... Pastor Don told me he spoke a little bit about was Matthew 24, Matthew 25, and people have a lot of questions about is this the, you know, the end times, you know, and I know Pastor Don didn't go into, well, you know, Jesus is going to return on this date at this time, and, you know, put it, because, you know, we don't do that, okay? It's, Jesus says not even the Son knows, only the Father, but there's some things that we look out for, right? And one seems to be a changing worldview towards our faith in the culture around us. One that seems to be growing a little bit more hostile towards the faith. And I wonder what it's going to be like when Jesus and our faith in Christianity is not viewed so popular. I'm not sure it's popular now, but I wonder what's going to happen as that trajectory goes down, right? And I wonder how many of us are going to stand strong in who we are called to be in Jesus Christ. And so part of today is learning what is the end goal. I'm not going to give you any purple Kool-Aid about the end of the world on this date or this time. I mean, really, they've been, you know, a long history. The medieval times were some brutal times, right? There were wars. There were rumors of wars. There were famines and plagues and all these things, right? However, I am marking certain things where there's cultural shifts, and I think we have to as well. And so the question becomes... Not so much what is the actual date of the end times, but are we living, right? Are we living in the last days and what are we called, who are we called to be in moments like these? What are the moments that we're living in and who are we called to be in moments like these? It's times like these where we may have a biggest testimony of who we are in Jesus Christ, but we have to know the end goal. Pastor Bradley, who was at one time Coach Bradley, right? When you planned a football practice, you had an end goal in mind, right? You looked at who the team that you were playing was, who the opponent is, and you strategized your, your defensive scheme, all right, or whatever you were trying to do on that opponent because you wanted to know the end game, correct? What is the end game? Who are we ultimately called to be is in many ways who, what this sermon is about. But it's not just who we're called to be, but who we're called not to lose in the process. Let me say that again. Not only who we're called to be, but who we're called not to lose in the process. And I'm going to give you a little hint. Jesus Christ is not lost. He knows exactly where he is. Exactly where he is. So let me give you this little illustration, if you will. When I was two years old, one years old, three years old, <clears throat> four years old, perhaps five, though I may not want to admit it, I had a favorite white blanket. I used to call it my white blankie. 
Sometimes when I was real young, my white lanky, yeah, okay? And I wiggled all the silk off the edges of it. I was like Linus from Peanuts. Remember Linus who just carried that blanket everywhere he went? This thing was so interwoven in my identity, that's why they call it a security blanket. Because it makes you feel safe. You wrap up in it, you're almost clothed in it. It became like a part of me. And my mother, my own mother, hit it on me in the attic. Yeah, I'm, other mothers are shaking their head, you know? It's a, it was a very scarring and traumatic thing for me. Mom, where's my blanket? I don't know. Do you not know? Right? And I was so distraught that she went and, oh, guess what? I just found your blanket in the attic. And I was only about four, maybe five. He's up, okay. Six or seven now, oh, yeah, right? And I remember thinking, I don't know how it got in that attic because I've never been in the attic. But isn't it something that my mother just found my blanket in the attic? All right? And so I went back to work. And you know what? God bless my mom. She knew she had to break it of me. But there is one who is our security that we are not to lose, that we do not outgrow, and who doesn't belong in the attic of our lives. There is one who clothes us with greater security, and we are never meant to outgrow him. And that is Jesus Christ who the scriptures say we are clothed in. And he has to be our identity. He has to be the fabric of our lives, the silk that won't wither away, the fabric of our day-to-day -day existence. Christ is the final blanket that we are clothed in. And my question for us today is, do we take him everywhere? Because I took my white blanket everywhere. When I got up in the morning, First thing I grabbed, my white blankie. When I went to bed at night, the last thing I had in my hands, my white blankie. I took it everywhere because it was my security and it was like it was part of me. You can make fun of me if you want. I may still own it. I don't know. I'm not going to answer that question. Okay? It's in the attic. I may have transferred attics in different houses, okay? But I took it everywhere because it didn't matter if people thought I should have outgrown it. It was part of me, so I took it everywhere. Brothers and sisters, do we take him everywhere? Or do we leave him in the attic when it's convenient or unpopular? Do we reach for him in the morning? Do we reach for him at night? Is he the first thing we cling to when we wake up? And the last thing we're holding on before our eyes see the back of our eyelids. Is he everywhere? Or is Christianity today starting to become where our faith is a piece of the pie rather than the pie crust that holds all the other pieces together? That is the question I have because as I was on vacation, I got to thinking and I got to pondering and the question that I felt the Lord continually putting on me as I was taking moments trying to look out in some scenic way over rocks in the ocean and saying, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from us? The question that keep rolling back in my head is, is our faith just a piece that can get put in the fridge? A piece of pie that's put in the fridge? A blanket that's put in the attic? Or is it the pie crust? Is it the very thing that holds on to us? Do we take him everywhere? Because I worry that modern expressions of Christianity are compartmentalizing and reserving the faith for over here and all the world for all the rest of our lives. And I'm going to say it one more time to you today. Jesus Christ has to be the pie crust that every other piece fits in. And I think we can actually learn something from an ancient verse that was recited three times in Israel. That faithful, faithful people of God, faithful Jews, recited three times. And it's called the Shema. Anyone ever heard of it? Put it up there for us, if you would. Now, a lot of people know the first two verses, the first couple lines about the oneness of God. I want you to see how important, though, it became in their lives. So let's read it together, shall we? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Say this next verse with me as well. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Stop right there. You got to love the Lord your God with everything you got. 
And we're going to come back to that one verse because it's loaded with meaning that we haven't even unpacked yet, but we will. But the bottom line, the catch-all message is you got to love them with everything you got. Now watch. Let me read this to you. Just soak this in. Watch how important it was that faith was the fabric of their life that they took everywhere. That wasn't meant to be hid in an attic. These words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Do we talk about the Lord when we're sitting with our family? Do we talk about him as much as we talk about football or sports or the Red Sox or anything else? And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, is it the first thing we're reaching for in the morning and the last thing at night? You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be on the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, houses full of all good things you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. See, we leave that part of it out, don't we? Lord, your God is one. Oh, yes, our God is one, right? What about the other verses? Make sure he doesn't end up in the attic. Make sure he's not the one pie piece of pie that's tucked away in the fridge. Take them everywhere with you. When you rise up, when you lay down. And what's the bottom line? The bottom line of the Shema is in those last verses. Lest you forget him. Because we have short-term memories. Watch if you don't take them out of here with you. If, you, if he's just the, the, pie crust, the pie that fits in this crust right here in this service, and you don't take them out here, and he has them in the frontlets of your eyes, Lest you forget them. Lest you're walking along because the enemy would love nothing more than for you to take just a few days, a few weeks, a few months off from remembering the Lord your God. Yeah, I guess today's sermon is, is he in the attic? Or is he everywhere? Everywhere in your life. Because if you divide yourself, if you divide the life of faith from the life of this world, if you divide and say, I have this life over here and this life over here, somebody is going to get lost. And as I said before, it's not Jesus. He knows exactly where he is. The person that will get lost is you. The true self, the inner man in here, there's a concept weaving this whole message, and it's about the inner man. It's about the inner person inside of us, and that person has to be Jesus Christ, alive. Jesus isn't lost, but the true self can be drowned out. Listen, follow me. I'm going to say this a few times. Drowned out by pressure, peers, power, and the purse. Let me say it one more time. The true self that you are in Jesus Christ can be drowned out by pressure, peers, power and the purse and the person that gets lost in it is you and it's me and I think even great writers that were not Christian authors I don't know what their faith is exactly and I'm not it's not my job to ju to you know judge them or anything like that but if you listen just to the cultural greats the culture the existential writers and Emerson right and Thoreau we're gonna have a clip from him you can hear that everybody knows down deep listen you don't even have to convince people of it because I can almost guarantee you everybody down deep knows something in here has got lost along the way listen to Thoreau how many of you have heard the, the book Walden or read the book Walden I know you have it's my father's favorite book. We used to sit when I was a kid and talk about it, right? Listen, listen to his words. Again, this isn't scripture. This isn't what we're standing on. I just want you to hear a cultural perspective about that inner man that gets lost along the way. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. I want to live with intention, he says, so I got to get out of all this craziness. I got to go where I can simplify life to find it again. 
right? To live intentionally, deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, the things that really matter, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Tell me people don't know that someone gets lost along the way. I did not wish to live what was not life. You know what that suggests? That people are living a lot of things that aren't really life. Tell me that's not true. Living is so dear. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. To live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life. To cut a broad swath and shave close. To drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And my favorite quote in this book that I think really speaks to the journey of the inner man, and it goes like this. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Some of you know it. Desperation. Somebody's lost, and it's not Jesus. Somebody's lost, and it's not Jesus. Someone needs to get back to finding the true self. Spiritually, we need to drive out the things that are not life. But what I would add to Thoreau's words is the Christian statement, the Christian proclamation is Jesus Christ is life. Jesus Christ is the intention and deliberate nature that we need to seek after to discover that when we die, we don't have a chance to really live because Jesus Christ is our life. Amen? Amen? We need to drive out the things that are not him, to not wish to live what's not him because living is so dear. We must crowd him into the corner, discover his essence, suck the marrow out of his righteousness to live so Christ-like as to rout out all that's not in him, to cut a broad swath, to shave close away that old man, that old self to discover in its lowest terms the mystery that is passed down from generation to generation, which is Jesus Christ in you. That's the inner man. Colossians says it. Colossians 1. Colossians 3 echoes it. The mystery passed down from generation to generation, which is Christ in you. That's the inner man. And if you leave him in the attic, you will find the person lost is you. Not him. He can't be the blanket that we outgrow. Listen, this discovery of the inner self, of the true self in him, do you know that's why Jesus Christ came? That you would discover your nature in him? Now, I know there's probably some going to say, hold on, pastor. He came to die on the cross, right, to forgive our sins so that we can have a home in heaven. Yes, and amen to all that. But I tell you today, brothers and sisters, finding him in you is salvation. It is eternal life. And if there's any truth to the statement, home is where the heart is, there is no eternal home like the heart that has Jesus Christ. The inner man... How do we find it? How do we reclaim it? How do we let the Holy Spirit just make it come alive in us and resist the powers of the peers, the pressures, the powers in the purse? How does it come alive in us? That's our, that's our topic today, and I'm gonna go back, if you will, to the Shema real quickly, because I think it has something to offer us about this inner man. And if you know Hebrew at all, you'll know that in Hebrew, there are some words in this Shema that can be translated a little differently. And so you're gonna have to put on a thinking cap with me for about two minutes before we take off again. Are you ready? That doesn't sound like you're ready. Are you ready? ready. Everybody's got their thinking cap on. Go to Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now watch. You shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. All, undivided, not a piece in the attic, not a piece of pie in the fridge, the whole undivided kit and caboodle, with everything you got. When you're in your jobs, when you're in your social places, with everything you got, 
you got to love them. But watch, with all your heart. Do you know in Hebrew that the word heart, it's different than we think. We think of the heart strictly as like emotions, even though the heart doesn't actually give you your emotions, but that's what we talk about it. But in the ancient Hebrew culture, the heart was connected to the will of a man. It's literally even has a translation of the inner man. The thing in here that makes you beat. It keeps you going. The inner man, the inner will, that's how they understood the term the heart. They al it almost has a connotation similar to the mind, okay? The inner heart, the one when no one else is around and all the facades fall away, all the masks that we wear, all the ways we try to get people to interpret us and see us and the things that we cover up, when it's all stripped away, the heart of a man is that inner essence, that inner being. And so is the soul. It says with all your soul. In Hebrew, that word soul means the, like that which you breathe in that gives life, the essence of life, and it means again the inner man. Both heart and soul in Hebrew mean the inner inner man. One is the essence of being, that's the soul. The other is the will and everything you got, and that's the heart. And then finally, with all your might, the entire force of everything you have in you. See, the whole Shema is about making sure that the inner man goes everywhere with him. That's what it's about. The inner person in you, Eric, has to be so tied to Jesus Christ, whether you're in this pew, in your car, in your job, wherever you go, Bob. Cheryl, the inner man in you strives to bring Jesus everywhere. And brothers and sisters, the church has to stop putting them in the attic. You want to know how to live in days like these, you got to know the end goal. And the end goal is for the inner man in you to be like Jesus Christ. The end goal is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The end goal is the mystery that's passed on for generations, which is Christ in you. The end goal is may they be as one, Father, even as I am one with you. The end goal is that Jesus Christ is alive in you. And that is salvation. And that happens because of the forgiveness of sins. And that is eternal life. And that is the heart that has made a home with the gospel. Amen? Amen. The inner man. What will we do? Jesus says it like this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the rest will be added to you. Listen, I told you we're in a series on the spiritual disciplines and the spiritual practices. And again, I thought about which one do I want to do? Do I want to do meditation in the word? Do I want to do um, prayer life? Do I want to do fellowship? Do I want to do worship? Which spiritual discipline should we do next? And I thought, no. The Lord, I felt, gave me pause over vacation as I was thinking about it. The, the question for today before we even go into them is, what is the point of any of it? The so what question. Every spiritual practice that we go over has a singular purpose, which is to conform you to the image of Christ, for you to find the inner man in him. And without it, spiritual practices don't mean a thing. Pharisees prayed, and they did it for show. They did it for the outer man, not the inner man. And Jesus didn't seem to think too highly of it. You can meditate all you want on Scripture. If it's not changing you to the image of Christ, the demons know Scripture, and they quote it. You can embrace yourself in the fellowship with others, but if all you are is about the outer man, you'll make everything about you. I'm going to give you three, three principles that are key to developing the inner man that are going to frame everywhere we go in this series. Whether I preach it, whether Pastor Don preaches one, Jim or Tony, whoever, wherever this is, there's going to be three 
underlying principles that govern this whole series to make sure that we aren't doing the spiritual disciplines for legalism or for, you know, just to be rigid in our faith. We're doing it because we are developing the inner man in Jesus Christ. And the first one is dependence. Now, the Shema says to love him with all your might. Let me tell you what the New Testament, what we realize. Your might is not enough without him. I know. Your might's not enough without him. You just read from Genesis all the way through, and you know what you discover? Without Jesus Christ, your might and your sense of trying to be righteous and your sense of trying to be perfect in him is going to flounder and flounder and flounder until you trade your life for his. Acts 4, 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Listen, and I'm not going to apologize it. I'm not going to put this in the attic. I'm going to put it out here, and it's online, and I hope everybody sees it. You can't please the Lord without receiving Jesus Christ. Because being a child of God means that we have the Son of God in here. And you can't please God if he's out here or in the attic. He's got to be right in here. Listen, the might of our own righteousness is not enough. If anything, the law in the old shows us that we can't do it on our own. Gives us, beckons us to the feet of the cross. Beckons us to Calvary. Beckons us to say, Jesus, take from me my life when I don't have the strength to give it away to you. As the third day song goes. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Who is it who strengthens us? Jesus Christ. All things require all power, and Christ must be our all might, not ourselves, but Christ alive in us. The Spirit of God moving through us as his people, coming alive in us. Jesus actually says things in the New Testament that would blow our minds about what we're capable of as his body, as the body of Christ. But it's got to be his might, not our own. And if you try to do it of your own, you'll find yourself flailing and floundering with the outer shell, never finding the inner man, which is Christ in you. So the first is dependence. The second one is adoration. you got to love him with all your heart, with all your will, with all that inner man inside of you. That's all your heart is all he asks. All your heart is all he asks. The gospel, listen, The gospel is a free gift. Grace is a free gift that demands your life. Listen, soak that in. Sit with that for a minute. It's a free gift that demands all of you. John 3, 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Some people just love the darkness more. They'll stay there. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That his works have been carried out in God. That his works, that his might has been carried out in the heart of God. You can have all the strength you want. If you don't have the heart for God, it's going to fail. It's going to flounder. A time is coming. Listen, it's coming, and I think in many ways it's already here where it is not going to be popular to say, I love Jesus Christ. Where it's not going to be popular to say, I stand on the word of God. The time is coming, and in many ways it's already here where it's not going to be, it's going to be such a temptation to put Jesus in the attic. you got to love him with everything you got. Everything you got. The whole inner man. Conformed to him. Amen? So again, the first one is dependence on him. That's all your might. The second one is adoration for him. That's all your heart. And the third one is built off of the Shema's all your soul. And this is a oneness with Jesus Christ. A oneness that is connected to God. And I know this one's going to be a little stretch for us to think, but I'm not going to cut it short. Okay? Okay? I believe that when Jesus says, I am in you, and you are in me, that there is an intimacy and oneness that we have with Jesus Christ that is beyond what the mind can even comprehend. Amen. 
you'll sit and you'll want to think it through philosophically and theologically, and you're going to come to a stalemate, and then you're going to open up your soul, and it's going to flood you, and you're going to know it because you're going to know it here. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Now watch, he's talking about the disciples there that he's with, but watch. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. How many of you believe because of the word that has been written here? How many of you believe because of the testimony of the apostles? How many believe because of the testimony of the 400 and who have seen them? How many of you believe because of generations and generations that have witnessed the miracles of Jesus Christ? You're included in this prayer. You're right here. You're sitting in the word. You're sitting like a seed in the soil. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. The glory that Father gave to the Son is given to you. That is a oneness with Jesus Christ that is only possible because of the empty tomb. Is only possible because we have been raised up with him. Is only possible because it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's only possible because there is a great mystery that has been unfolded, which is Christ alive in you. Oh. I in them you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. The goal of this life is the journey of the inner man. That Hebrew concept of the inner man with all your heart, tongue, all your soul, Jim. All your might, Jim. The adventure of faith to the mountaintop is to find the transfiguration of yourself in him. My attachment to my blanket was outgrown after four years. Some may say five. They lie. My attachment with Jesus Christ continues on for all eternity. Amen. And it's our calling, brothers and sisters, to love him with everything you got. And in the process, find yourself. To rework the words of Thoreau, we need to seek out the kingdom of God because we wish to live deliberately. To front only the true essence of life, which is Jesus Christ and see if we can't learn what he has to teach. And not when we come to die, discover that we had not gained life in the process. We don't wish to live what's not life because living Christ is so dear. We want to live deep and suck all the marrow out of our faith to live so sturdily and Christ-like as to put to rout all that's not life in him, to cut a broad swath and shave close away the old self, to drive true life into a corner, reduce it to its lowest terms until all that is left is Jesus Christ in me. And that, brothers and sisters, is salvation. That, brothers and sisters, is life. That, brothers and sisters, is the heart that has found home. It's time to take him out of the attic. Let us pray. Lord, I can't help but believe that someone needed to hear this message today. That there's someone in our midst, maybe, who your spirit has revealed that it's time. It's time to embrace the Savior. Oh, Lord God, I pray that someone's heart will be changed today. I pray, oh, Lord God, that as a church that 
Maybe there's people here today who need to be baptized, who need to make that commitment to Jesus Christ. Take them out of the attic and put them into the heart. Oh God, I pray that someone's life is changed today and that you will be pleased and will glorify thee forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high, every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know.
song. This is about trading that old life for the life in him. It's about finding the inner man. It's about trading your sorrows and your shame for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sorrows and I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord.
And it has been said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And to that we say, Jesus, we are desperate for you. Now, we are going to do a benediction. I'm going to... We're going to go two minutes longer than normal here. We're going to do a special benediction that talks about that inner man adoring our God. And I'm going to teach it to you if you don't know it. Okay? And some of you may. It's called, how many of you heard, Father, I adore you? Okay? And we're going to do it as a round. So this side, you'll see the lyrics up there. You're going to, it's very simple. You go, Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you, how I love you. And then you'll do sun, and then you'll do spirit, okay? We'll do the whole thing. It's very easy. But this side is going to start, and on the second line, that side will start, okay? Let's try not to mess it up. This is the benediction, okay? This side with us. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Jesus, I everyone. God bless you.